Okay, so good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, well, this is just the first day of, of this course. You learn a lot about uh, uh, fluorescence microscopy and confocal microscopy till now. But now we have uh, to run a step back and uh, we have to go to the basis of the basis. I would like to help you to reorganize your backpack with the essential you cannot do without when you want to correctly uh, manipulate your, your sample. Uh, but, okay, uh, don't worry because in the next few days uh, you will have a lot of fantastic presentations uh, and classes uh, about the most advanced and innovative techniques. Um, so I hope to be not too boring <laughs> and uh, during the next day uh, you will go as they say um, from zero to hero and well now I'm here to be your zero okay mm -hmm. so uh, let's go uh, first of all uh, I think this is the most important question you have to ask yourself when you are uh, manipulating uh, and uh, um, preparing a sample for microscopy. So, do I believe in what I see? This is really critical because uh, we very often take for granted that uh, our immunofluorescence experiment is a true immunological reaction, but very often it isn't. And you have to be absolutely sure that uh, this immunological reaction is really uh, true. Of course, I'm speaking of the reaction between your primary antibody and your antigen of interest. Um, there are a lot of different types of specimen uh, that you can uh, manipulate and prepare for fluorescent microscopy and confocal microscopy. Now we are going to concentrate just on immunofluorescence because, of course, we do not have a lot of time and I want you to have a lunch <laughs> in less than an hour. Okay, so do not lose your capacity to judge critical, critically your work. This is really, really uh, important. So what can we do to uh, work properly with our samples? Okay, first of all, we can optimize and control the following steps. The fixation, the permeabilization, the blocking, the staining, using fluorophores in this case, because we are, we are speaking of fluorescence, the mountain and the cover slip. It seems uh, very trivial, I am conscious of that, but uh, uh, I hope uh, to give you some uh, tips or some suggestions or just, uh, I would like just to arise some, some questions. Uh, regarding this very, very, basic procedures. Okay, let's start from fixation. We routinely in our labs uh, use two types, uh, mainly two types of fixations. Uh, one with cross-linking fixatives, I mean aldehydes, and the other one with reagents that precipitate proteins like alcohol or acetone. So let's move to aldehyde fixation. Of course, aldehyde fixation uh, works uh, because there are uh, the formation of cross-linkings between amino groups. Uh, we can use uh, uh, formaldehyde or butyraldehyde. Is it, is it this one? Okay. Okay. Or butyraldehyde. And here uh, we have uh, a, a table in which I can compare the uh, characteristics of the two uh, aldehyde that we can use in our labs and we have a fast penetration versus a slow one, a slow fixation versus a fast fixation, a reversible cross-linking. This is an important point because remember if you fix your sample in paraformaldehyde and then you put your sample in PBS or in another buffer and leave your sample in the fridge or on the shelf or whatever you like for weeks or months, you do not have, when you decide to perform your immunofluorescence, a tissue well fixed because the cross-linking, the formation of cross-linking 
is it is not a irreversible um, uh, chemical um, um, situation. Okay, uh, then uh, we have a two-dimensional cross-linking versus a three-dimensional one. We have a poor morphological preservation with paraformaldehyde versus a good morphological preservation. This is the reason why glutaraldehyde is the uh, first choice for electromicroscopy. And this is very important for us when you want to perform an uh, immuno uh, staining. Paraformaldehyde has a low degree of antigen masking. And this is really, really critical when you, you want to uh, use an antibody to see uh, your antigen of interest. Um, of course, glutaraldehyde, it is not, not our first choice for immunofluorescence, but there are some exceptions. And for example, if you need to uh, uh, see uh, a very, very small molecule, you have to uh, choose uh, glutaraldehyde instead of paraformaldehyde because paraformaldehyde is not able due to this um, uh, due, due to the um, three dimensionality of uh, uh, of the cross linking it is not able to trap uh, very very uh, small molecule like for example GABA that you can decide to stain because you need to see some GABAergic neurons for example okay but let's move to formaldehyde fixation that is the most common uh, when we want to uh, use uh, aldehyde. Um, this is the molecule of formaldehyde. Okay, probably all of you uh, know it. But maybe what you, um, you don't know uh, is that this is the active form. So formaldehyde, the, the small molecule, the single molecule of formaldehyde is, is the active form, is is the molecule able to create the cross-linkings that you want in your tissue, on your cells. Why I'm telling this to you? Because uh, routinely we prepare solutions of uh, uh, formaldehyde molecules uh, starting from the powder of paraformaldehyde. We need to uh, dissolve the powder, increasing the temperature, increasing the pH, you already know, uh, to obtain uh, a lot of single molecule of formaldehyde starting from some larger polymers, okay? So you want to obtain single molecules because the larger polymers are not so active in the fixation. Okay, so now you have a very nice solution with a lot of single molecule dispersed in water, but what happens? when you have these single molecules in, in, in water. As a function of time, the formaldehyde tends, the single molecule tends to reform polymers. So this means that you can absolutely to, if you want to be sure that the concentration of formaldehyde is under your control and you are really working with the percentage that you dissolved, and the percentage that you dissolve is due to active forms, you have to use fresh prepared paraformaldehyde, okay? Do not leave it on the shelf, do not leave it on the fridge, and this is absolutely compulsory if you need um, to work with uh, um, animals and you need to perfuse animal, okay? Otherwise, the quality of your tissue will be absolutely horrible. Hmm? Then remember that uh, if you have uh, polymer, you will have a slower penetration, of course, a poor fixation and even a worse background in, uh, in your uh, um, tissue or section. So you want small polymer, prepare fresh PFA solution. If you, you know that you don't have time, Refresh, prepare it in, in advance and then store it at, at minus 20 because this way you can preserve the single, uh, the single active forms. Okay. Um, well, remember that formaldehyde is able to cross-link uh, also nucleic acids, so it is useful for in-situ hybridization. And 
Remember that cross links are cleavable at pH 8.5. This could be a useful trick to restore some antigen binding site. It is a very mild, gentle treatment that you can use if you need an unmasking step in, in, uh, in your uh, protocol. Okay, let's move to formalin. What, what, is, what is formalin? Formalin is nothing than a um, ready-to-use solution of uh, uh, formaldehyde. The content is around 40%, so a 10% formalin will give you the standard 4% formaldehyde that is um, what routinely is used for a standard uh, fixation. But remember that uh, formalin contains also methanol up to 10-15% as a stabilizer. Otherwise, uh, uh, you will have a, a very huge amount of very, very uh, big polymers in, in, uh, in the solution. And, uh, but you do not know, you are not able to uh, know how many active forms you have in, in, in the ready-to-use formalin, okay? So, my advice is avoid to use formalin and prepare your fresh PFA in, in the lab. But why I'm talking about formalin? Because it could happen that you can have a sample from, from a colleague, from a hospital, from another um, structure, another institute, and maybe they fixed their sample using formalin. And you have to know that the fixation protocol was totally different. Otherwise, you cannot compare some results uh, that you have to replace, replicate in, in your lab, okay? <coughs> so here you do not have uh, a, a control uh, content of active form and you have methanol that it is a permeabilizer. So you can the cells of the tissue already permeabilized. You have an extraction of lipids, okay? So remember, if you receive samples uh, fixed with formalin to replace exactly uh, in the same way, uh, exactly the same, the same fixation, you have to use formalin uh, to. Okay. Okay. These are two pictures of um, students of, of, of mine and uh, he came to me just asking a new aliquot of DAPI because he said that uh, uh, he was able to stain the nuclei of uh, the cells but uh, uh, the, 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 next, uh, the next experiment was totally horrible and you can see the nuclei are not well stained so in, in his opinion the problem was uh, the, the aliquot of DAPI. As you can easily imagine, the problem uh, was not DAPI because here you can see the nuclei, but as, as you can clearly distinguish, they are exploded. So probably the problem uh, stays in uh, the fixation. So I asked him which was the difference in terms of fixation of the two, uh, of the two samples. And it was uh, really a long story because he said that there was no difference at all, exactly the same solution, exactly the same time. So everything was absolutely identical. But uh, um, after some more questions, I uh, uh, discovered that uh, these cells were fixed uh, for uh, five minutes at room temperature, and that one for five minutes with the same solution, but at four degrees. So. Remember, this is just to uh, remind you that uh, not only the time, but even the temperature, it is really, really critical to obtain a good, a good fixation. This is another example of another student of mine. This is a live cell um, staying with sir tubulin, and he was interested in these very nice uh, uh, wavy structures. But after the fixation, uh, in 4% paraformaldehyde dissolved in PBS, these structures disappeared. So he was aware that the problem uh, uh, stayed in the fixation, but he didn't know what, what he had to change 
to, uh, to, to, to see this nice structure also in, in, in the fixed cells. So I suggest him to read this paper that is very nice. I can give you uh, a lot of suggestions. And inside this paper, uh, the suggestion that could help this, this student was uh, prepare paraformaldehyde in stabilization buffer. This is just to preserve cytoskeleton. So uh, what I want to stress using this example is that not always PBS is the right choice. So you have to uh, understand what you want to see and you have to check in the literature which is the buffer, the best buffer uh, to see that can help you to preserve and, uh, and, uh, and to help you to visualize the structure you are interested in. Okay, so be uh, careful when you have to follow a protocol of fixation. And remember, you have to check the concentration, the time, but also the temperature and even the dissolving buffer you, uh, you have to use. Okay, disadvantages of aldehyde fixation. Um, very often you have a poor penetration of antibody due, the, due to the cross-linking, so you have to think of uh, a non-masking step. Uh, and you can have even a denaturation of, of the antigen. Uh, also in this case, due to the formation of cross-linking. Okay, um, let's move to alcohol acetone fixation. Uh, this type of fixation is able to precipitate proteins, so it is good for cytoskeletal proteins. But remember that it denaturates proteins, so never use this type of fixation if you have in your sample some fluorescent protein, EGFP, and cherry, and TD tomato, whatever. Do not use this type of fixation, even if it is suggested for the um, antibody, the antigen-antibody reaction that you want to obtain in, in, in a second time in, in your tissue or, or sample. And then, uh, as I uh, told you, extract lipids, so you have um, a fixation and also a permeabilization of your cells and tissue. So you do not need an extra step in, term, uh, in terms of permeabilization. Disadvantages, small molecules will be lost during the subsequent processing steps, and you can have also in this case uh, uh, the denaturation of, of the antigen. Okay, uh, let's see what happens when we have uh, the fixative induced fluorescence. Um, especially when you're working with, with, with section uh, of tissue, um, you can have uh, uh, the reaction of, uh, of uh, aldehydes present in your fixative solution with tissue components. And you can obtain an image uh, like, like this one, in which you have this green yellowish uh, emission, uh, and uh, you have to face this very horrible background. Um, remember that uh, it is worse with uh, glutarahaldehyde. This is another problem of using glutarahaldehyde. It is worse when fixation is warmer or longer. So what you can try is to change the temperature and, and the time of, of fixation to try to re reduce this type of background. And it is worse, of course, when you're working with all solutions. But now I know that you will prepare every time fresh PFA solutions. So this will not be your uh, problem no more. Um, Okay, mm, what I want to uh, underline is that very, very often this uh, autofluorescence phenomenon uh, due to the um, links of aldehydes with, with, with your tissue uh, is um, um, considered, it, it is pretty high, pretty boring at uh, low uh, um, wavelength and uh, it is reduced in longer wavelengths. So this is a section of a brain section. This is just uh, the autofluorescence uh, from the section. And as you can see, it was possible, it is, maybe it is not very, very clear, it was possible to perform a, a staining on some neurons 
just using the red region of the spectrum, because in this region, I mean, at longer wavelengths, the autofluorescence is really, really low. Okay, so if it is possible, if you don't need to use the green channel for another fluorophore, if you don't need to perform multiple staining, this could be a nice strategy to avoid the, um, this very, very annoying background. Okay, so the redder the better in this case. Okay, uh, then remember that you can have some biological structures or uh, uh, molecules inside uh, your, uh, your um, tissue, uh, like lipofushin. Lipofushin is a degradation product of uh, lysosomes, uh, and, and they are able to emit light, or elastin fibers, or collagen fibers, or even uh, some NADH and FAD molecules. So you can see something in, 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 in your tissue sections that uh, um, it is absolutely uh, normal <laughs> uh, to see in, uh, in the tissue. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, you have just to um, understand what you're, what you're looking at. Okay, methods to counter uh, autofluorescence. Of course, again, use fresh uh, PFA solution. You can introduce a step with glycine to feed the formaldehyde groups, free groups, or you can introduce a step using sodium borohydrate to reduce the aldehyde groups, or you can try Sudan black or toluene blue to quench the autofluorescence, for example, of, of the structure that we have just seen, or you can try to extract lipids if the uh, fluorescence you want to remove is due to uh, lipophilic molecules. I want to uh, spend a few words uh, um, for a sodium borohydrate because it is a very, very nice uh, um, strategy to reduce uh, uh, background. Uh, this is the section before the treatment with sodium borohydrate and this is after the treatment with sodium borohydrate. Here you have this very simple recipe if you want to try it. And there is another advantage because somehow uh, sodium borohydrate is also able to uh, restore uh, uh, antigenicity. So it is a, um, an unmasking um, step that can help you to, uh, to see better your antigen or to see your antigen if you uh, wasn't able to, uh, to, to see. Okay. So, um, another um, absolutely uh, critical point when you, um, when you, when you are um, um, designing your, your protocol and you want to check if uh, uh, your um, fixation uh, works uh, well, as you, as you expect, is to check for the autofluorescence in, in your sample. <clears throat> this is another example from a student of mine. I'm sorry, but I'm showing you a lot of very bad images. <laughs> this, I think it's the, the, the only lecture with the very <laughs> horrible images, but okay, I think you can learn from them. <laughs> Um, okay, the, this was, this was uh, uh, the, the, the image of, of a section, a brain section. He used uh, an antibody against uh, a nuclear antigen. Uh, of course, uh, the tissue was uh, fixed and he used uh, a primary antibody and the secondary antibody conjugated with Alexa 488, so emitting in the green range of the spectrum. So, he asked me for an opinion. I, I said, but <laughs> As you can see, this is not, not so nice. So I asked for the uh, control of the secondary antibody, that was this one. So uh, in these uh, 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 sections, he didn't use the primary antibody, just fix the tissue and use only the secondary one. And as you can see, the fluorescence is still there. So you can suppose this is an aspecific binding of, of the secondary antibody. So this is, for sure, it is not a true immunological reaction between your primary antibody and the antigen you wanted to see. But it was so horrible that I asked also 
for another control. I wanted to have a look of the tissue fixed without any and, 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 and treated without any primary or secondary antibody. And as you can see, it is pretty similar. Mm -hmm. So what you can conclude is that this is just autofluorescence of the tissue. No, no, you do not have any <laughs> true immunological reaction and you even do not have any secondary a specific binding. Okay, so this is a, um, very, this is a, a check that it is very easy to, to, to perform. You can do it every time you uh, are looking uh, at a new antibody or uh, you're using a new antibody or looking a new antigen or you're working with a new tissue just to be sure that you're looking uh, really at, at what you want to, to, to look at. Okay. Let's move to uh, permeabilization, the second step. Uh, permeabilization, uh, okay, as I said, if you use alcohol, acetone, you have your cells or tissue already permeabilized. If you are using uh, aldehydes, you need to uh, permeabilize yourself. Um, okay, this is not completely true because uh, when you fix uh, cells or tissue, a sort of permeabilization due to, to the cross-linking um, is, is um, developed in, in, uh, during, during the, the fixation. So, uh, but in principle, you do not have a, a nice permeabilization that allows your antibody to reach the antigen. <clears throat> you, can, you have two choices. You can use some mild permeabilizer or some strong one. The mild permeabilizer are, for example, digitonin or saponin. They are extracting selectively cholesterol from the plasma membrane and uh, uh, they create some uh, little hole. They are so little that uh, you can maintain the ultrastructure of the membrane. You can even use the cells for electromicroscopy. So you can understand <laughs> what I'm saying when I say uh, um, mild uh, permeabilization. Then you can use a strong permeabilization using Triton, NP40, Twin20 or, or IGEPAL. This is a non-specific permeabilization. These are um, detergents that are extracting uh, lipids in a non-specific way. They are creating very, very big holes and they, but remember that they they can extract uh, together with lipids also some uh, lipophilic proteins. So be aware if your antigen of, of, of interest is a lipophilic membrane protein, you have to play carefully with, with, uh, with the, the uh, permeabilization step. Okay, uh, remember that the same permeabilization protocol may have different effects depending on the cell and tissue types that you are using. So of course you can start from a certain protocol, but then you have to optimize it on your own specimen. Okay, I want to show you um, just an example from this paper, that it is nice because also here you can find a lot of subject suggestions. And uh, uh, the example is this one. They use these 293 T cells fixed with paraformaldehyde and permeabilized with methanol. And uh, here you can see the clouding 7, that is a protein of the cap junction, uh, tagged with EGFP. Okay, so you can see the uh, emission of the fluorescence of the EGFP. And then they perform an immunofluorescence using an anti cloud 7 antibody. And they were able to obtain also in this case uh, a staining with the fluorophore. This should be the, the merge in green and red, but well, it is not so clear. Uh, what it is important is that it was possible to uh, obtain uh, the um, uh, reaction between the primary antibody and the antigen. 
But let's see what happened when the cells were permeabilized with Triton. Okay? You can see, of course, the Clouding 7 tagged with EGFP, but it wasn't possible to see the Clouding 7 using the antibody against Clouding 7. So this means that the only difference between these two experiments was the permeabilization step. Okay? So it is a step that seems to be very trivial, but sometimes could be helpful even trying to play with the permeabilization, changing the concentration, changing the um, permeabilizer. Okay? Okay, blocking, just a few words about blocking. Blocking, it is just a magic cocktail of uh, um, molecules that we want to use to reduce the background. So we, we have antibodies that are working, so our fixation is nice, the permeabilization was nice, we are seeing something, but we have some uh, background that we want to improve. And we want to move from a situation like this to a situation like that, in which the background and the aspecific is really, really low, so that the image is clean and, and, and clear, and, and you can distinguish very well your um, um, antigen of, of interest. Okay, uh, the, the, this background uh, in general could be due to uh, unreacted aldehydes that may cross-link uh, antibodies to inappropriate structures, and you can uh, fight this problem with uh, a step in which you introduce a solution with lysine, or you can have structures within the sample that may trap antibody, and you can use a solution containing bovine serum albumin, or gelatin, or dry milk, or a mix of two of them. And finally, you can have also low affinity polyclonal IgG as your uh, secondary antibodies that may bind to inappropriate structures. This way, you have to introduce in your cocktail uh, fetal bovine serum, or if you want to be very elegant, pre-immunoserum from the same species of, of the secondary antibody. This is compulsory if you're working in electron microscopy, but in the 99% of the situation, FBS is, is enough uh, for uh, optical microscopy. So also in fluorescent microscopy. Okay, so I want to show you which was the difference in the treatment of, the, of this uh, Sample in this case we use 5% uh, bovine serum albumin, and in this case 2% uh, fish gelatin. Okay, so it was a very stupid step because you have just to change the composition of your blocking solution and substituting VSA with fish gelatin, but you have a dramatic improvement in your background. So also in this case, I invite you to play with the composition of your blocking solution, okay? Do not take for granted that the protocol that uh, your colleague uh, gave you is the, ju just the best one, because maybe it is the best one, but for another sample, okay? For another type of experiment. Okay, staining. And now we can speak about floor four. Uh, Okay, we, uh, in immunofluorescence we can have a direct in uh, reaction or an indirect one, this is the most common, so we are using a primary antibody against our antigen of interest and then we use a secondary antibody against the species of the primary conjugated with the, um, a fluorophore. Okay. Uh, so we are really interested in, in fluorophore. So, you uh, have learned a lot about fluorophore uh, during the, uh, the lesson of, of uh, Gabriele and Alessandro. We can play with fluorophore and we can uh, have different colors uh, just uh, uh, following the uh, possibility that the uh, light uh, spectrum uh, gives us. But 
you now uh, um, know pretty well because of the previous lectures that it is absolutely not a matter of color or not simply let's say a matter of color so you cannot uh, choose your floral for just because you like green or because i don't know red is the uh, color of the i don't know spring summer season of 2023 uh, but there are some very important uh, features of, of the floral for you have to take into account to decide which floor for you want to use in your sample because it is really dramatic to work a lot on your sample and to uh, mm, the, mm, and to have a not perfect, not uh, uh, usable um, samples, uh, well stained, just because you bought the wrong, the, the, the wrong, uh, the wrong uh, floor for. So this is really critical, and, and my advice is uh, pay attention to what you want to buy. Ask uh, to um, the commercial guys from the different company for every characteristics. Now we will see one by one of, of the fluorophores and uh, uh, do not think that uh, it is a good idea uh, to buy a very, very cheap fluorophore because you don't want a cheap fluorophore that doesn't work. Okay. So um, as uh, Gabriele already said, uh, every fluorophore has an excitation, a combination of excitation emission spectra that is the fingerprint of this, of every particular uh, fluorophore. So you have to know it because this way you know which filter you have to use, which laser line you have to select to excite uh, the fluorophore. And um, very, very important, uh, you have to know the quantum yield or the quantum efficiency of, of the fluorophore, the lifetime that is directly correlated to the quantum yield. So a very high quantum yield means a very high lifetime. And this is also really important. Also, Alessandro previously um, has pointed out uh, the importance of uh, uh, photoresistance. OK, so the combination of uh, excitation emission uh, spectra. You already know how to read this, this diagram. Uh, this is uh, the spectra viewer, as uh, um, Gabriele uh, suggested you to uh, search in a spectra viewer site. I like the, the one from the Chroma uh, company. Uh, Chroma is a company that is producing the, the filter lenses for more or less everybody, <laughs> I think. Uh, it is really complete uh, and you can play with it. You can select hundreds of, of, uh, of uh, fluorophore and, uh, and then you can uh, check uh, for the excitation and the emission curves. And you can even play with the cursor to see um, at, uh, at every uh, wavelength which uh, is the, um, which is the um, efficiency in terms of uh, uh, excitation. Uh, of course, uh, you will have uh, different uh, uh, spectra for different fluorophores. This is uh, the one for, for DAPI. And uh, um, I want to um, <clears throat> say uh, another time that you have to be aware of the uh, eventual overlapping of the emission curves. Now we are speaking just of the emission curves. Uh, you can, of course, uh, uh, try to use uh, two fluorophores that do not overlap uh, uh, very much, but as Alessandro told you, you can even use, for example, the confocal microscope in a sequential way, and uh, uh, so you can overcome this problem without uh, uh, buying a new, uh, without buying a new, a new um, fluorophore. Uh, what it is really important, and Alessandro already said, but I want to stress it again, uh, you have to be sure, absolutely sure, be because now you do not have any trick to solve the problem. Um, every laser has to excite no more than one floor for your sample. This is absolutely compulsory. 
remember you 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 have to have you have to stick in your mind one laser for one and only one floor for and this is a very important reason to uh, check the excitation curves of every single floor for you want to have in your sample if you are designing a multiple staining i want to show you an example not because it is um a special but because a student of mine <laughs> As I told you, uh, design this experiment. Mm. So she had, because it was a girl, <laughs> it is a girl. <laughs> uh, she, uh, she had a red fluorophore, Alexa Fagnan 4, in, in the sample, and uh, the, the tissue produced a um, green fluorescent protein. And she wanted to add a third fluorophore and she wanted to add a blue fluorophore Alexa 405. Okay. Um, what uh, Gabriele said is absolutely true. Alexa 405 is a really horrible fluorophore, so don't use it. <laughs> but uh, uh, th this was the real situation that I faced some times ago, some years ago, and I want to reproduce exactly the same, the same uh, problem. So um, she asked, uh, is it a good idea to use uh, this fluorophore combined with uh, this red and this green uh, fluorophore? OK, forget for a moment that Alexa 405 is, is, a bad, is a bad fluorophore in terms of efficiency. Let's have a look of the excitation curves. OK, this is the excitation curves of the Alexa Final 4 that you can excite with the Final 4 laser and you can obtain a very nice excitation, 97%, okay? This is the excitation curves of the EGFP, and we can use the 488 laser with a nice excitation close to 100. And this is the curve of the Alexa flu, um, 405. We have to use the 405 laser. Also, in this case, we have a very nice uh, uh, excitation, 85%. Okay, so what happened when we are working with the Alexa 405 together with the EGFP? Okay, so here you have the two curves. The problem is this one, look. So the, the 405 laser that we had to use to excite the Alexa 405, is able to excite also the EGFP, and it is not negligible. It is around the 20%, okay? This means that every time that in this sample we uh, use the 405 laser, we will have, in our final image, we will acquire, in our, in our final image, the light coming from the EGFP and for from the 405 together okay so and it is not possible to distinguish who is who okay so please every time you have to perform a multiple staining check uh, accurately for the overlapping of the excitation curves and search for a laser or eventually change the floor for because you need absolutely one laser, one floor for. Okay. Okay. So, and let's go to quantum in that uh, uh, Gabriele introduced this morning. Quantum yield is the, from a statistic point of view, the quantitative measure of fluorescence emission efficiency, and uh, uh, in synthesis is could be defined as the number of photons emitted per photon uh, absorbed. Typically ranges between 0 0.05 to 1. 1 is absolutely hypothetical because it is not possible to have one photon absorbed and one photo, uh, one photo absorbed and one photo uh, emitted. Uh, it is strongly environment dependent and it is proportional to lifetime. I mean, a high quantum efficiency means a high lifetime. The lifetime is, of course, the, du the duration of the excited state of the floor. Form. And now I want to uh, show you this table in which you can see just uh, 
um, a list of, of, of some fluorophore and you can compare the quantum efficiency or the quantum nil, it, it's the same, of, of, the difference, of the different fluorophore. Here, for some of them, uh, it was possible to find also the, the lifetime. These, these are informations that are not uh, so easy to find, to find in the net, and there are a lot of companies producing fluorophore that are not able to give you, I don't know why, or maybe there is a reason. <laughs> Uh, but they cannot uh, tell you which is the quantum efficiency of uh, uh, the fluorophore they produce. So, as you can see, there are fluorophore with a very, very high quantum efficiency, very close to one, and uh, other with a very low quantum efficiency, like Alexa 555, as Gabriele said <laughs> previously. Uh, and then there is this fluorophore. Look, Alexa 633 with not detectable quantum efficiency. This means that life technologies, that is the producer of, of, this, of this fluorophore, it is not able to detect the, the efficiency of this fluorophore. So you can imagine how horrible it is, because if they are not able to, to count how many photons is able to produce for every photon absorbed, uh, okay, so you can have some suspect uh, on, on the possible performance of, of, of this fluorophore. What it is strange is that uh, Alexa 663 is a bestseller of life technologies. This is why I want to um, attract your attention on, on this fluorophore. And I want to underline that you have to be very careful when you buy a new fluorophore. It is a bestseller just because a lot of standard microscopes mounted in the, in the basic equipment a 633 laser line. So people say, okay, I buy a, a fluorophore that I know I'm able with the 63 laser to excite at 100%. And this is true because if you use the 63 laser, this is the excitation curves of Alexa 63, look, you are very close to 100, but 100 of nothing. <laughs> because, because the emission is not detectable, so the efficiency is not detectable, okay? So, I, I, I hope I, I pass you the, 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 the message, be, be, be really, really careful. In this case, you have a solution. You can avoid to use the Alexa 63, you can move to Alexa 647. It is not wonderful, but it's enough <laughs> for us. And if you check in the Spectra Viewer, this at the right is, is the curve of, uh, of the Alexa 647. Can you see? You are exciting at 50%. Not, not bad. Okay, you can work. Okay, you, you can use it. Okay, so this could be a solution if you need to perform a multiple staining and you need a floor, you have a 63 laser line in, in your focal microscope and um, you want to uh, have a floor for in, in the far right region of, of the spectrum. Okay, photoresistance. <clears throat> this is another very, very important point. Uh, Okay, we faced this, this topic in, in the previous lectures. Um, you know that uh, uh, you have to face the photo bleaching because you have to expose your floor for to, to the light because you need the excitation. But you have this photon-induced chemical damage. There is this covalent modification that is irreversible and your floor for is no more able after this modification is no more able to emit uh, light. Okay, dramatic. Dramatic, but what you have to take into account that it is this one. You can have a fluorophore that it is able to emit just a few photons between, before the photo bleaching. And you can have some other fluorophore that are able to undergo thousands or millions of cycles before photo bleaching. And what do you want? The first one? No. Why? Okay, you need to have a sample very stable. You want to acquire a lot of images. You want to acquire a very huge stack of images because you need a very wonderful 3D reconstruction, right? 
Okay, so you have to ask to uh, the commercial guys also this information. It is very difficult to have it, <laughs> I advise you. But you need it because otherwise you do not know if you will be able to acquire properly your images. Okay, this is just an example, the same sample, the same antigen, uh, staying with Alexa 488 and Alexa uh, 546 or with fluorescein and, and citrine. Fluorescein is a wonderful uh, fluorophore in terms of quantum efficiency, but it photoglitch just in a second. Um, okay, and now this one. This this is is um, uh, a gift for you because it is really difficult to find some some information like like that one in in the net. And um, now I I'm going to explain to you. Okay, in this um, in this graph, uh, they compared seven different dyes, green emitting, five minutes, <coughs> uh, green emitting. They use the same protocol, the same sample, the same type of illumination, blah blah blah, and they check the photo bleaching. So they perform the same type of illumination and they acquire images uh, for twenty seconds just to see the um, phenomenon of photo bleaching on different type of fluorophore. Uh, okay, you can see the Alexa 488 uh, starts uh, very high. This means that the quantum efficiency is, is really high. And after um, 10 and more than 10 seconds, of course, uh, the um, efficiency uh, goes down due to the photo bleaching. We can say more or less the same for MFP, okay, it starts a little bit lower, but uh, the performance finally, finally was not so bad. But then look at these two, Northern Light and High Light. They, they start very, very low in terms of quantum efficiency and uh, they go worse and worse during the, the time. Or Chromeo and Promofluor, they start not so bad, but after five seconds, you have a very horrible performance. So they are absolutely not photoresistant. Okay? So this, you, you have to know this information because you have to know which type of fluorophore you have in your sample. Because your sample is precious, you spend a lot of time in preparing it. Maybe you have some uh, molecular biology, infection viruses, uh, different um, type of treatment and blah, blah, blah. And you cannot uh, waste and throw away everything just because your fluorophore is a has a very bad photoresistance. OK? OK, quenching. Quenching, it is not uh, photo bleaching. It is just... Uh, uh, the uh, reaction of the fluorophore with the, the molecular oxygen or aliphatic or aromatic amines, and you can fight it using anti-fading mounting media. Uh, so, again, pay attention when you have to decide which fluorophore to use. Remember, check the quantum mill, use the best, use the best fluorophore for the most critical antigen you have. Okay, so take advantage if you have an antigen that is very rare or you have a, a primary antibody that is working not so well, take advantage of the fluorophore. Uh, check spectra overlapping when performing multiple staining and in synthesis collect as much info as, as possible. Okay, mountain and cover sleep, this is the last one. I have two minutes, <laughs> but I, I, I want to cover this, this topic because uh, also, this topic is, is, is very um, less discussed, and I, I want to, to um, give you some, some information that probably you, you, you don't have. Okay, uh, mountain, just to preserve your sample, to rise the refractive index, to obtain the same refractive index of uh, very close to the glass, the one of the glass, and the one of the oil that you are using with your uh, immersion uh, objective and contains scavengers for free radicals and uh, um, aromatic or aliphatic amine. Uh, these are just three, three, uh, three of them. But I want to move to this topic. My 
last uh, suggestion is use the right cover slip. Okay, it is re it, 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 it seems uh, not so critical, but it is. And I want to show you uh, why it is critical. Uh, first of all, use the right cover slip means um, you, you know you have this inscription on every um, objective because the objectives are designed to work perfectly with the cover slip, a cover glass with a thickness of 0 0.17 millimeters. Okay? And it is not the same to work with cover slip with other thickness. So, what you have to be sure is that you have in your store or you buy by yourself cover slip of 1.5, number 1.5. So very often we have in our store cover slip number one, but this is not the right one, okay? The thickness is lower, can you see? So you want the cover slip 1.5 uh, number, so check. When you, when you will be back in your lab, check the, the number of your cover slip. Because what happens is this. You have a dramatic decrease in terms of fluorescence that you are able to catch from your sample if you are working with objective of numerical aperture uh, bigger than 0 0.5. If you're working with objective of 0 0.5, I mean, could be a 10x, a 4x, no, not absolutely no problem. But if you're working with objective of, of a high numerical aperture, you have a very dramatic decrease in terms of the fluorescence that you can collect from your sample just due to the thickness of your cover slip. And this is an example. Suppose you're working with a 40x objective, 0 0.95 numerical aperture, and you're using a cover slip number one instead of 1.5, okay? You have a loss of 60-80% in fluorescence signal. So, it's a fight because <laughs> you, you, you spend a lot of time in preparing your sample and then you waste away 60-100% <laughs> of your fluorescence just because you are mounting your sample with the wrong cover slip. No, also, it, it is absolutely horrible. So you, you have to check which cover slip you routinely have in, in your lab and eventually uh, by uh, the right one. So, this is the last one. So, your take or home message is take your time uh, in designing your experiment because if you do not know the how and the why of every single step, if you process your sample superficially or, or in um, an incorrect way, the, the time that you can spend at a very new, super cool, wonderful confocal microscope could be for nothing. Because if you, if you have a very bad sample, you are not able to obtain good images. So finally, I want to remind you the three rules of sample preparation. The first one is the law of 5P. Proper planning prevents poor performance. Okay, this is really important. The second rule is one lab, one protocol. Absolutely no. Every experiment, a dedicated protocol, okay? Of course, you have to start from something, but then check every step and try to optimize every step for your sample and for your experiment. And finally, remember that garbage in means garbage out. I mean, bad sample mean bad images. And that's all. So thank you for the attention and have a nice lunch. I think you are. <laughs>